Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. I would just like to say a big thank you to Blackout Bingo for sponsoring this video today. When I was growing up, I've always loved playing bingo. I remember sitting with my nan, playing at the local seaside amusement arcades back in the long hot summers. So I'm very excited to tell you about this game I've been playing. It's called Blackout Bingo. Blackout Bingo is a really fun mobile game where you can make money playing bingo. You and your competitor get the exact same bingo card and then the bingo numbers start getting called faster and faster. So winning is entirely based on how fast you can react. For me personally, I really enjoy playing this game. The music really does complement the game as well. It helps set the tempo and keep you going. Blackout Bingo is owned by Skills, S-K-I-L-L-Z, who hosts casual tournaments for millions of mobile players worldwide and they also distribute millions in prizes each month. Skills has great support and prides themselves on their ability to match the players based on their skill levels. So if you're an expert, you'll get to play with other great players, and if you're a newbie, you'll get to play with other new players. Also, if you just want to play for free, you can play free head-to-head -head games as well. And if you're playing for cash, you can cash out at any time you choose. Now you don't have to go down to your local bingo hall, or bar, or even the amusement arcades to play bingo. You can play anywhere, anytime, from your mobile device, and you can even win cash prizes. Getting started is easy, just click on the link below in the description. If you use my code DOUBLE5, you'll get an extra $5 in free cash to play with on the app when you make your first deposit. For today's true crime narration, We'll be taking a look at one of Canada's most sensational crimes and one of its longest ever court trials. Our story centres around a man named Peter Demeter who was born on April the 19th, 1933. He lived in Budapest, Hungary and he was born to an upper middle class family of four consisting of him, his older brother and his mother and father. He enjoyed a very comfortable lifestyle even being taken to school every day by a private chauffeur. However, things would take a quick and drastic turn for him on January the 2nd, 1945. The apartment building that his family lived in was struck by a stray Russian shell when Peter was only 12 years old. Over 400 people died and rescuers only managed to save 23 people, including the young Peter and his mother. The family tried to get back on track and Peter went on to study to become an actor. But he was expelled from school in 1953 because of his family's long history of being anti-communists. In 1954, Peter fled to Vienna where he lived in a refugee camp. He got a job at a local radio station interviewing other refugees and talking about life behind the Iron Curtain. It was during this time that he met his lifelong friend, Saba Silagi. In 1956, he briefly moved to Canada, but then had to return to Vienna to look after his sick mother. Then in 1957, he returned to Canada, this time for good. He even convinced Saba to move with him, and they lived with Peter's cousins until they got on their feet. Peter only had $8 in his pocket when he moved to Canada but he quickly started earning money as a real estate agent. He sold homes to other Hungarian immigrants and by 1962, he had founded his own real estate company, investing $20,000 to build an apartment building in Ontario's West End. He allegedly made that $20,000 through a scam that involved tricking investors back in Hungary, but this was never proven. In 1965, he traveled back to Vienna where he met a 29-year-old model, Marina Hunt. Peter fell in love with her, proposing to her only the second time they'd met in person. But Marina was happy with her life and she rejected him. Peter reportedly suffered a nervous breakdown after the rejection, 
and even spent three nights in hospital before returning to Canada. Peter did not give up on Marina. He continued to write her love letters and despite her having a serious boyfriend at the time, Marina returned them. In 1966, Peter returned to Vienna so that he and Marina could celebrate the one year anniversary of meeting each other. But it was during that time that he found out about Marina's boyfriend. Peter became enraged, showing up at her home and assaulting her. Just two weeks later, he met someone new, a lady by the name of Christine Ferrari. Christine was also a model. She was born in Austria and had been married once before to a man named Herbert Handling. The two had a son together, but Christine wanted to pursue a career in modeling and the couple divorced with Herbert gaining full custody of their son and Christine moving to Vienna. Peter and Christine quickly fell in love and Christine moved back to Toronto to live with Peter. She tried to carry on her career as a model, but Peter became very controlling. There are reports that Christine had an affair during this time and that this was the reason behind Peter's change in behaviour. She showed up one evening at a friend's house with a cracked lip saying that she did not want to be in a relationship with Peter anymore. Her friends bought her a plane ticket back to Austria, but Christine never used it. Instead, just nine days after her 27th birthday, she married Peter Demeter. The couple lived a lavish lifestyle thanks to Peter's success as a businessman, and in 1970, they had a daughter named Andrea. Peter was happy at first, but quickly became suspicious of another affair because he believed that his daughter, Andrea, didn't look anything like him. He reached out to his old flame, Marina Hunt, and the two began writing to each other once again. In 1973, Marina wrote to Peter to tell him that she was getting married. This prompted Peter to buy her a plane ticket to Quebec, and the couple spent a romantic weekend together in the city. At the end of that weekend, they had decided that they wanted to be together. Marina went back to Vienna to sort out her life there and had a return plane ticket booked for a month later. Just four weeks after this weekend, Christine Demeter was dead. Peter and Christine had been spending the weekend hosting friends and a few of their family members at their home in Mississauga. On July the 18th, 1973, Peter took the group into Toronto to go shopping leaving Christine and their daughter, Andrea, to spend the day relaxing by the pool. Peter spent most of that day with one of the friends, and during that time, he told this friend about how he and Christine had been having marital problems. He even told them about Marina's recent trip to Quebec, and that he had only married Christine because Marina had turned him down. The group returned for dinner, but Peter's guests were disappointed that they'd not been able to find what they were looking for in the shops. Peter said that he would take everyone out again after dinner so they could go to another mall. He packed them all in his car, even the family dog, sent away his gardener and left Christine and Andrea alone in the house. They returned from shopping at 9.45pm. Peter even noting the time and saying that they were home just in time for coffee. He had bought a locket at the mall, a present for his wife's birthday the following week. However, when he opened the garage doors, he found Christine lying in a pool of blood. Andrea was in the house unharmed. Peter called the police, first telling them that there had been an accident and his wife was dead, and then saying that he thought his wife had committed suicide. When the emergency services got to the home, they quickly realised that Christine had been murdered, but Peter started to argue with them. He said that she must have fallen while trying to reach for something in the garage, even standing over her body and demonstrating how he thought it had happened. However, it was established that Christine had been hit seven times in the head with a blunt object and had defensive wounds on her hands. The police quickly became suspicious of Peter, he had already admitted to them that he and Christine had been having marital problems, even bringing up Christine's $1 million life insurance policy, and so Peter was asked to come in for questioning. The police became even more suspicious when they found out that Christine had been in contact with lawyers a few weeks before she was murdered. 
Christine had found the love letters between Peter and Marina and she'd wanted to find out about her rights to make sure that she kept custody of their then three-year-old daughter, Andrea. It would take another month, but on 17th of August 1973, 40-year-old Peter was arrested and charged with non-capital murder. Five days later, on the 22nd of August, he was released on $75,000 bail whilst maintaining his innocence. Meanwhile, Andrea went to live with Peter's cousin and his wife. When the trial began over a year later, it was a media frenzy, with Peter hiring lawyers who were known to be slick and sleazy, and his lover, Marina, who was now living with Peter in the house where Christine had been murdered, testifying that she loved him and completely believed in his innocence. The prosecution brought out a surprise witness, Peter's old friend, Saba Silagi. Saba had already admitted to the police that he'd known about several of Peter's plots to kill Christine. He said that one time Peter had planned to electrocute Christine in the pool and thought about tampering with her car. But the most important part of Saba's testimony was that he had been wearing a wire whilst talking to Peter after Christine's death. He had managed to recall Peter, telling him that he was confident that they would stay ahead of the police and that he was angry at the hitman for killing Christine in a way that couldn't be written off as an accident. Another prosecution witness testified that Peter had hired a Hungarian hitman called The Duck to kill Christine. This hitman was later identified as Imre Olejniak, who had already returned to Hungary. Unfortunately, Imre died before the police could have him extradited. The trial drew to a close after 11 weeks and the jury of nine men and three women deliberated for almost 48 hours before finding Peter guilty of hiring someone to kill his wife. Peter tearfully addressed the court, stating that he was not guilty. He was then sentenced to life in prison. It was reported in the press on the 10th of December 1974 that Peter was being held in a three foot wide cell in an ancient jail in London, Ontario, which a grand jury had described as not fit to house cattle. The only toilet provision was a plastic bucket which he had to carry out and empty before being locked in at 9pm each night. Peter appealed his sentence, but this appeal was dismissed by a panel of five judges in December 1975. To this day, he maintains his innocence, even saying that he would never hire a hitman to kill his wife, especially at his own property, because it would immediately drop its property value by half. He was later convicted of a further charge of arson after paying $8,000 to have someone burn down his Mississauga home. Ten years into his sentence, Peter was released on day parole and lived in a halfway house in Peterborough. Whilst he was there, he tried to orchestrate the kidnapping and killing of his cousin's son as a punishment for his cousin mismanaging his finances and because he believed that his cousin had not raised his daughter properly whilst he was in prison. Peter was quickly rearrested and then sometime after ordered a similar plot from behind bars against the daughter of his former lawyer. He was caught both times and both cases resulted in him receiving four more life sentences. There are conflicting reports on how much Christine actually knew. She reportedly told a friend that Peter would never let her get a divorce because she knew too much about his financial dealings. Saba also said that Christine had once offered him $10,000 to break Peter's arms and legs. Also, there have even been reports that Christine had been trying to hire a hitman to kill Peter before she was murdered by the hitman that Peter hired. But we will never know for sure how much truth is in these reports. Peter is currently 88 years old and despite suffering from multiple bouts of cancer, a stroke and several heart attacks. He has been denied parole at every hearing as it is deemed that he is still a danger to society. A judge once said of Peter, if Peter Demeter is a psychopath, he has a unique feature. Instead of burning out as he gets older, he's getting worse. Peter has spent most of his adult life behind bars 
and that is where he's most likely to be whenever his grisly life of kidnapping and murder comes to an end. For those of you that are wondering what happened to Andrea, when she is asked, can you ever really get over something like that? Her answer is no. She has had a lot to deal with whilst growing up. And whilst having some positive highs, she's also had some real lows. But she has tackled everything that has been thrown at her and is now a truly inspirational woman, now choosing to help others with their recovery. She has her own website called scratchrecovery.com which explains what she's doing now and there are also some blog articles that are well worth reading. That concludes today's story. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks once again to Blackout Bingo for sponsoring this video. Please support the channel by clicking like subscribing and commenting. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. A few years back, I was lucky enough to spend a week in Mississauga. I spent all seven days calling it Mrs. Swaga, and no one corrected me. But now I know it's called Mrs. Saga. Goodbye.